Hey there, it's time for the show The Tatiana Show Where you make friends and talk life and crypto Hey guys, have you heard about the Haven app from the guys over at Open Bazaar? Download Haven now for iOS and Android. Go to gethaven.app. Haven is the world's first privacy-focused shopping application for iOS and Android devices. Why use apps that spy on you? Shop, chat, and send cryptocurrencies privately using Haven. Haven gives you a shopping marketplace, social posts, private chat, and a powerful cryptocurrency multi-wallet all in one mobile app. Download Haven now for iOS and Android. Go to gethaven.app slash Tatiana for $5 off. This episode of The Tatiana Show has been brought to you by eToro.com. You can trade in a wide range of assets, connect with the crypto community, and automatically copy top-performing portfolios at eToro.com. Quite simply, they have the top currencies, smart tools, low fees, social trading, all in one simple app. Connect with over 11 million eToro traders around the world using social feeds. eToro makes powerful trading tools easy. Get started in minutes. It's right now at etoro.com. That's E-T-O-R-O.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tatiana Show. We're doing a legal episode today. We're joined by Sasha Hodder, an attorney friend of mine and a cool uh, crypto cucumber that has their own podcast. And, of course, we're joined by Josh Agala of Voltoro, running a uh, campaign right now on Bank to the Future and hanging with us, as always, on the Tatiana Show. Hey, Josh, how are you? Hey, it's Tatiana. It's wonderful to be back. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, the, the Bank of the Future thing is really fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to watch, uh, uh, the, the, you know, this thing unfold of, of, of crowdfunding. I really love crowdfunding. I think, like, especially equity crowdfunding. It's fantastic. Well, luckily, our guest knows a lot about that. Uh, yeah. Sasha has been advising projects in the crypto space for quite a while. So uh, let's jump right into it. She's been a guest on the Tatiana show before. But Sasha, thank you so much for joining us. And I'd love it if you gave me a little bit of background about what you were doing before you got into crypto and what brings you to the show today. Oh, sure. Thanks, Tatiana and Josh. Great uh, to talk with you. I think it's been a year since I last saw you in Vegas, um, but uh, congratulations yeah. you were born too. Um, yeah, I guess uh, Tatiana, <laughs> my background, um, I started out actually as a trader for TD, what was called TD Waterhouse at the time, now TD Ameritrade. And, uh, and I just kind of worked for, for TD for quite some time. I switched from being a trader to a, uh, a financial advisor, and then it wasn't paying any money um, at the bank. So I switched to a mutual fund company, Franklin Templeton, and uh, worked as an inside sales rep there. And then got laid off in 2008, did my MBA, and then uh, got a job working with NEI Investments as a wholesaler, so selling mutual funds to the banks. And then um, then I decided to quit that, move to Florida, go to law school. And uh, during that time, I, I learned about Bitcoin and uh, started working part-time for a Bitcoin ATM company. And then once I finished law school, I uh, started working at the firm I'm at now, DLT Law Group, where we do um, a lot of work for, lately it's been a lot more, everyone seems to be registering as money service businesses. So there's a lot of legal work involved with that, that uh, they need to write compliance policies and uh, set up their KYC stuff for how they're going to handle that. And then other companies that have already been uh, registered as money service businesses with FinCEN, they need to do an annual review for their banks every year. So um, that's the main thing I've been working on lately, is those annual reviews for people. Yeah, I mean, you said that that seems to be something that everybody's required to do, and it seems sort of onerous, but there's also a lot of different crypto law news you also do a law show with Tone Vase and you have your own podcast. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. My podcast, it's a, it's a lot of fun, but I've been kind of slacking over the summer. I think I've put out, you know, one or two in the last little while. And um, But I'm going to try and my goal is to, to uh, start doing it more regularly. But uh, it's always fun doing Tone's show because he has... Uh, a group of, I think there's about 10 different lawyers in this Telegram chat. And whenever he does the show, you know, we get five or six of them to jump on it. And it's really good getting the 
perspective from all these different attorneys because sometimes you don't know if you're understanding you know something the way that other it's it's kind of good to have validation that other people read the you know whatever it is the statement that was put out or whatever kind of regulatory action it's good to find out if they understand it to mean the same thing that you do as it applies to crypto so tone, tone had a busy day on twitter yesterday though did you see no i didn't yeah he's been coming under fire because he put he put some uh, comment out there. Someone messaged him off LinkedIn asking to have a conversation. And he's like, don't you, haven't you Googled me? My rate is 0.3 Bitcoins an hour. And then everyone like made memes about it and stuff. And then he, he boycotted the magical crypto con because he thought it was a bunch of, um, you know, shit coiners doing a Bitcoin conference. But then he was at a conference today on stage with Noriel and, uh, and Craig Wright. And so they were all saying, oh, you boycotted our conference, but you're willing to go speak with, you know, the biggest scammer out there, Craig Wright. And then Tone went on a, on the stage with a shirt saying, everyone is Satoshi except Craig Wright. <laughs> so <laughs> like fun. So did he redeem himself with that? I think so a little I bit. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I thought, I thought he, and actually Adam Back of uh, Blockstream kind of came to his defense. Chimed in. You know some of the comments on these tweets too so it was uh it was fun to read through them yesterday so there's been a lot of news in crypto tell us a little bit about what's happening and what do people have to keep their eye out i mean uh yeah i mean what's been happening in the news lately yeah so just last week it was a really busy week the fincen sec and cftc put out a joint statement we got an announcement from the IRS, TON uh, or Telegram tokens, they got a um, emergency cease and desist from the SEC, Bitfinex got a class action lawsuit, and, um, and then Ethereum, the CFTC deemed that it's actually a commodity, and then we saw Facebook get uh, lose a lot of its um, people that were supposed to sign on like PayPal and MasterCard. And then it came out that some of the senators were writing them nasty letters. So it was, it seemed like a lot happened last week, but. Uh, wow. So which one of those should we unpack first? Cause that's a lot of, that's a lot of action. Which one do you think is the most, I mean, what, what about Facebook? Let's talk about that. Everybody likes to hear about Facebook failing, Facebook succeeding. I don't know. All of a sudden I'm sort of hoping that they'll be able to do something. Cause I think they can give some pushback. To the government yeah. but, but i don't know you guys tell me what what's happening what do you think of it josh of the whole thing that yeah i mean like i i'm a big fan like i call myself a, a competition maximalist and so i i really like the idea of competing i would never use facebook coin ever but i like the idea that the market decides that it's not good money and not the jackboot of some government saying nah we want a monopoly on uh, the issuance of currency and um and you don't have a choice uh, whether you use it or not because we're just going to shut it down granted definitely uh, we don't want uh, any money laundering uh, you know if we don't want money laundering and all this sort of stuff but like facebook pretty much has all data on all users i'm pretty sure if uh, you know any money laundering is the last thing that they need to worry about because they can check pretty much everything um so i i do feel like um it's really a nice see-through mechanism that's happening right now where the normal person can see like, wow, that's why Satoshi created the blockchain. And people talk about blockchains for all these other reasons. But at the end of the day, blockchains were created for things that governments have a monopoly on or, or would like to shut down, i.e. currency or money. And so when Bitcoin was created, it needed a decentralized mechanism. Uh, it needed a, a decentralized ledger and the blockchain was invented for that reason. And uh, now we can see why it's so important to have decentralized money because, you know, certain states uh, around the world wouldn't like to have competition in the space. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I think they would have shut down Bitcoin a long time ago if they could outright, although they're they're making some trouble. And then the IRS got involved. So what's happening there? Well, yeah, so the IRS just last week put out a guidance saying that you have to pay tax as income on any fork coins you receive. It doesn't even matter if you redeem them or not. Just if you receive them in a wallet that you have control over, you're supposed to report that as income too. So a lot of people that got 
you know, Bitcoin Cash, it had a, a pretty big value at the time that it was airdropped. I think, I, I forget exactly what it was, but uh, I think it was like, you know, 2400 or something like that per coin. And uh, so that could be a pretty big tax burden. And even if you didn't sell them or do anything like that, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, it does from the IRS's perspective. That's how if money comes into your account, that's considered income. And that also with crypto becomes your cost basis. And then when you go to sell it, if there was a profit or a loss from the time that it hit your account, that's how you calculate um, your capital gains or capital losses. So I see where they were coming from with it. That's, you know, they set it up the same way as, as they would anything else that, that would hit your account. But the the part that's weird here is you don't have control over whether someone gives you this gift um, of an airdrop and so to make you have a big tax burden for something that you might not have wanted is um you know it doesn't seem really fair what but, if you don't know that you even have it yeah i mean the 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 application of this is really going to be like there's no way that to enforce this i don't believe because so many people like any you know those my ethereum wallet it, there were so many airdrops that came to that in like 2017 and 2018 if you had any kind of address on there um everyone was airdropping tons of different random coins out and those coins could have had value at the time but have no value now so uh I, you know i think you know the very most conservative people will probably report all of that but i haven't logged into my ethereum wallet in a long long time and i don't even know what's in there and i haven't sold you know there's some of the coins that are in that probably don't even have a market anymore to be sold on so i just don't think it's uh i mean the the proper legal advice on it is yes you have to pay on every single thing of that but you know the enforcement or the like application of it how are they going to know who's is what and you know it's it's a tall order to yeah it seems well, like it's a also a big grab. burden it's a big burden on their accounting department i mean people because we've been somewhat unprepared i mean it's been 10 years but we're still getting clarification about a bunch of different things uh it just takes so much time to try and keep track of this stuff and some of it is simply people forget that they have it you know yeah and uh Someone brought up on in, on Twitter. I saw that there's a thing where if you get an if you get an inheritance of a gift, like from a relative who passes on, and you don't want that gift, you can disclaim it. So I wonder if you can disclaim your airdrops too. If you didn't sell it and you know use it or anything, then you can probably just there's probably a way to disclaim it. But uh, yeah, it seems like a ridiculous order. I mean, it seems like it was put in place by someone that just has no idea whatsoever apart from the fact that what there's this thing called airdrops so it sounds like people are just getting free stuff and let's tax it I, it sounds totally unthought through yeah because i mean even on bitcoin how many different for and it counts for forks and airdrops so i think there's something like 74 different forks of bitcoin so to, to, you know, have an account and have to go through and figure all that out for each person when a lot of the forks are completely worthless. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like saying, oh, I have to pay tax on every new website that pops up on the internet. I, I, there's no way for me to even know. I, I don't have time to keep up with who's creating a website. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have time. If someone creates a fork of Bitcoin, I mean, I could go off and do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, no one would even know it happened really. I mean, <laughs> because it would well, be some small crap thing that no one cares about. Uh, it's just this, this, this is the sort of regulations that I find really, really. Uh, so it sort of, it makes, it makes the whole idea of solid regulations laughable. Like I'm a big fan of good, proper regulations that make sense and, and create a fair market. Um, if that's what they're there for, you know, if, if that's really what they're there for. But to me, a lot of this stuff just seems like a power grab or a, like ditch effort, last ditch effort to try to somehow stack some sats by, uh, by <laughs> on the government's behalf. I don't know. And 
And I, I feel like they should make the regulations on a go forward basis for things like that. It should be like, okay, starting today, this is how we're going to treat airdrops and, you know, not go backwards on things that already happened that people didn't know were going to be taxed or, but yeah, how it works, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, 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 the state has a far larger, uh, well, has the ability to have expensive software that tracks and does all this stuff. Uh, the normal person that buys some crypto wouldn't really understand what's going on. You know, I'm talking about the average person here. I'm not talking about Adam Back or or someone you know that really understands what's going on on the technical front. But the normal average user, which there's plenty of now, really has no idea, and it's just a tall order to expect that. Mm -hmm. And it really makes it difficult to use Bitcoin on a regular basis if, if you're going to have to calculate your taxes, if you want it to actually spend it on, you know, I think Starbucks takes it now or Whole Foods and, it, you know, it would just be really awful to try and have to go back every, you know, a couple months and figure out all your transactions. So it's, well, it's not a fair that, treatment, that's for sure. And that's a really good point, Sasha, because... What's happening, and this will happen really quite quickly, I feel, that the crypto companies will just leave the US. It's already happening in terms of in the investment space. If there's a good STO or if there's a good investment opportunity um, in a company, you know, we're, we're currently doing a crowdfund equity crowdfunding sale on Bank to the Future, all US people are just denied from participating. Um, uh, you know, If they do want to participate, they have to prove they're a credit investor and contact us privately. But this is just sad that uh, for a country that is that has been built on the entrepreneurial spirit, has been built. I mean, the, the, the concept of investing is almost a U.S. invention. It's really in the in the lifeblood of the U.S. people. You know, that's why the film industry boomed so much in the U.S. because people could invest in films, could invest privately. Oh yeah, I'll 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 be the executive producer of that. That sounds great. You know, you get these really uh, whereas in Australia, you just don't have that, for instance. You don't have that culture of investing. And, and it's done the U.S. so well in the past where people have been able to create value. The Germans, for instance, they just save. They, they've got so much savings in banks. They don't do anything with it, cash because of uh, you know, the wars that have happened over the years. Here in Europe, Europe, they have a whole different mentality to investing. They're very conservative. And I feel like a lot of this power grab that's happening in the regulatory space and crypto and technology as a whole has really been stifled uh, by this sort of power grab of, of regulators and, and, uh, and taxation authorities in the US, which is, which is really sad to see. And especially, maybe it's not even a power grab, maybe it's just not having enough clear information and any clear information that is out there just makes it prohibitively difficult. So it's just easier for any startup that's actually creating value in this space to just block US investors. And wow, moving forward, how sad that US investors cannot uh, invest in some of these amazing companies that are popping up that are bringing great value and can return great value to the US, to the US uh, people. But people are still coming here, right? I mean, have they officially chased anyone out yet? What's been the latest? I mean, how's, how is it being treated in California, for example? I mean, Silicon Valley is still a big, big center. I mean, I would say anyone out of Silicon Valley is really heading to Zurich. You know, even if they're based in Silicon Valley, they're starting to set up the companies in Zurich. I spoke with somebody in Estonia, and honestly, even Estonia has really good um, circumstances. But I wonder how it'll turn out. I guess, yeah, all the business will go to other places and that'll be it. I found um, the Swiss to be somewhat conservative in their investments. But I know that there are some people that are definitely looking forward. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I, I think a lot of U.S. investors that are hungry for the new crypto projects are still probably able to access them using a VPN. But, uh, but there's no, they, you know, that's starting to be caught in the eyes of the regulators, too. And things are in the, one of the more recent Bitfinex um, actions out of the from the New York Attorney General they're saying that that that's not okay you have to do something more than just a, like blocking people saying you know you can't come but then allowing VPN um, access to it but I don't know how companies can stop that um, you have to do some kind of 
additional software on it to to know where the IP address is or I'm not, I'm not sure on the technical side but and then also um, EOS got in trouble for that too recently they got that 24 million dollar fine from the SEC because they didn't um, have a way to KYC people and um, they said that they blocked in US investors but the reality was a lot of US people still invested in it so why do you think they got such a small fine? Not that I would want them to get a bigger fine, but do you have any thoughts on why that occurred there? Well, um, oh, what's the name of that, Craig? Is it Bitcoin J Jazeera or something? That the fun, really funny articles that come out, um, Coin Jazeera, I think is the, the name of them. They, they had a kind of a parody um, article about EOS and they said that, and so, you know, I think what's really funny about their articles is often there's a lot of truth to it. Um, and so I don't know if this is true or was just made up, but they said that it, the, the EOS Foundation had donated a lot of money to the SEC. So that could have helped them. <laughs> but also EOS is, um, I, I work with a couple of people that are really uh, big into EOS and they, they'll talk all day about how it, it actually was decentralized at the time of the launch. Like it was really well thought out at the time that they, they launched it, that they had people all over the world kind of pulling the trigger to set it up at the same time. So it might be, it's, it's not a low hanging fruit, that's for sure, for the SEC to go after and say that that was an unre you know, unregistered securities offering because they'd have to they'd have to figure out a way around to say that that decentralized way it was launched was actually a centralized um, thing. So I think it was just, it was well designed at the time that it made it very difficult for the SEC to, uh, to say that, but then they still got them with the, you know, the not, not KYC and people. And um, um, so do you think that Bitcoin is safe right now and the government is only focusing on blockchain projects and ICO stuff? Or where would you think the um, the focus is right now? I think so. So that joint statement that came out from FinCEN, SEC, and CFTC kind of. So last May, the FinCEN on May 9th put out a big guidance talking about how a lot of different types of projects need to register as money service businesses. And so that's, I think, where Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin's downfall right now, or however you want to look at it is, but any transfer of one coin, any kind of coin to another is supposed to be regulated almost through, well, it's supposed to be registered as a money service business. Like even people on local Bitcoins, who are selling their own coins um, fall into that category if they're advertising and holding themselves out as a business. So I think that's where the regulation on Bitcoin is the strongest right now. Um, or well, the IRS stuff too. But the SEC, like Bitcoin, is considered a commodity. So the SEC side of it, you know, if you're if you're doing different things on top of Bitcoin, that that can possibly bring you into the SEC zone, like selling swaps or um, future contracts, things like anything that, well, the CFTC has the Commodities Exchange Act that anyone doing like head, bigger hedge funds or things like that, that, that include Bitcoin in it, or um, when you're holding custody of it as an investment for other people then it, it comes into those categories. But FinCEN is pretty much a catch-all that any kind of transfers of Bitcoin between, between people that's, you know, from businesses need to register. And what that means is you have to, it can't be anonymous uh, is what they're trying to do. So then that, I think that kind of changes the whole value proposition of Bitcoin. If, if it's not gonna be an anonymous currency, then what is it? It's like an overall surveillance scheme that they can see, you know, every transaction from who you're transacting with from, you know, back to day one. So it's, uh, I think it's a little bit dangerous for the future of Bitcoin um, if everything becomes KYC. Yeah, KYC is a very interesting uh, topic that I find fascinating because in one way, I can totally understand uh, authorities wanting you to do that. But at the same time, it, they're almost um dropping a massive stone on their own foot because 
if everyone starts catering KYC, like if, if my, if my KYC information is on 200 different services, it only takes one of those services to be hacked. And now with deep fakes coming on harder and harder, it's really quite easy. I can see a future where your identity just doesn't mean anything anymore because anyone can create your identity with the data that's been leaked already about you. And once that data has gone, it's gone and there's no way to get it back. And this is a lot of the, um, a lot of the topics that the, even the cypherpunks were talking about back in the day was about having uh, a human, if you're, if you're a person and you have an online presence, then you build an avatar, which around that is cryptographic proof of who that is. And it becomes either a bad actor or a good actor over time. And it would be costly to be able to be a good actor for all those years and then do a bad act because then you would have to go to zero with any sort of uh, trust that you've built up through that. And that entity would be KYC. Now, if that entity loses, act, like if that gets hacked and that entity gets uh, compromised, then you would have to fire up a new entity. But you can do that because you're separate from the actual hacked entity. Uh, whereas if you're the root of that entity and you get hacked, then you've got no, nowhere to go. It, it, you've been hacked. Your, your identity has gone. And, um, and I really wonder how this will play out in the future because it is looking like there are more and more pushes towards extremities of KYCing. And we, it is an online environment, which is almost, you know, it, it can be faked. And in the future, you know, these deep fakes are getting so extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite an interesting topic of how this will all play out. Yeah, it's a little bit scary. What do you think about that, Sasha? Yeah, um, I, I agree around the KYC stuff of how much information they have. And um, it just doesn't see. And some of the banks are worse than the government, too, because if you want to be a money service business, then it's even harder to get your bank account. Um, there's only a few banks that, that I'm aware of that will deal with money service businesses that are in crypto. Um, and a lot of them require that you have a million dollar balance in the account before they'll touch you. So it really leaves smaller starting up companies in, in the lurch without bank accounts. And, uh, and then when they try to get the bank accounts, the bank will ask them to have even more stringent KYC information than what the FinCEN requirements are. And then there's always the OFAC requirement too, that basically takes your requirement of capturing who the person you're transacting with is to a $0 limit. Like you can't do, to, to really be in compliance, you can't do a single transaction with anyone without knowing who they are because there is always the possibility that they're on that OFAC list. So when the banks are scrutinizing these smaller crypto companies compliance policies, they wanna see that you're capturing it at ground zero there's not even a 500 hundred dollar minimum or anything like that, that 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 can slip through um without without kyc in the individual so and then a lot of it's done through the cell phone so the cell phone companies you know i don't think when we got cell phones that was designed to be our main way of knowing who each person is but that's that's a pretty big way of identifying someone is if they can get a text on their phone and then you know their phone's registered with you know, whatever company and, you know, that name from them. And there's, there's a lot of information sharing going on there. And uh, yeah, yeah but and now even the fate like Binance, oh my God, I tried to get my account, like, you know, they recently froze everything for us people. And then you have to KYC yourself to get verified. And I, I forget exactly the process, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it was facial recognition and some kind of, I don't remember for sure if it was them or another one I did, but one I had to do a voice print on it to get on. And um, they're really, you know, stepping up how much information is collected. Uh, yeah, wow. I mean, you know, if you imagine all these extra steps that people take, it seems like a, a collection of this data, which can be then used to create more fake stuff about you. If you have a voice print with Binance, you have your face with Binance and you, you turn your face multiple ways up and down, left and right. You have a video of that, that gets uploaded. Now that gets hacked sometime and this information gets sold on the deep web or whatever. Then someone can use that to basically start opening up accounts in your name. Um, 
and yeah, laundering money. So it becomes a downward spiral of complexity and it actually works ag against the security of money, uh, of, 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 of having this, uh, this money laundering and the objective of anti-money laundering laws. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting field. What are the best solutions for this right now? Like, what are people using? Are there any companies that are bridging the gap? Um, I mean, to help get bank accounts and stuff, all of those chain analysis or cipher trace, things like that are really, uh, it's like almost becoming a requirement that a company be employing one of those type of uh, chain analysis tools. So I think they're really, that business model, while I'm sure it serves some great purpose, um, it's, you know, erasing the, the an anonymity of Bitcoin pretty quickly for um, you know, but, but they're, they're making killing because a lot of banks are saying you have to have those, um, employed and they, and they charge like 2000 a month or, you know, various different, there's lots of fee levels that you can select from, but they're not cheap. That's for sure. So it's, it's a big barrier for companies trying to get started if they have to pay for that. Is but, New York still a problem? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's uh you still need that bit license there, which is very difficult to come to get i mean the fee of it is five grand just to put the application in but then there's a whole lot of uh you have to give your 10-year resume with it um you have to show all your different bank accounts like prove your assets uh for you and any of your business partners and uh it's and then you do all that and they take for from what i'm aware I, i've only done gone through that application once and uh when it came time to to submit it, the person decided not to bother with it in the end. So um, I don't know how long, but what I've heard from other people that have applied is that sometimes it takes years. Yeah, there's a definite so there's risk. A... Sorry. Go ahead. Me. No, go ahead. There's, there's a definite, uh, you know, burden reward ratio there that's just not being met. And it seems to me like it's a, it's a, it's a clever way of, just banning crypto with uh, by it, it seems to me very much like the whole atlas shrug type of deal where you get the old guard and i know this is very conspiratorial and it can sound like that but you know it's like the old guard banking systems are really just uh, got their friends in the and they're very comfortable in the corridors of power uh, would be like well let's just uh, you know over regulate this thing to make it overly burdensome for anyone to even bother uh, with it that way we're not banning it outright but it's just just will never never take off the problem is this is a global movement and i feel like i said in the beginning that the u.s would the consumer the u.s investor will just miss out on something that's really important and that is the invention of digital rare assets uh becoming mainstream and being at the beginning of that is obviously very lucrative and one thing, Tatiana, when you asked that question and I answered with cipher trace and, uh, you know, chain analysis, what I should have said probably or pointed out is non-custodial ways of trading Bitcoin are not regulated right now. So it's only if you're holding someone else's Bitcoin for them. If you are doing a completely non-custodial type of exchange or uh, business model, then then it doesn't fall into the FinCEN regulations. So I think people are really focusing on that when they're building new projects now, trying to create them completely non-custodial. And that's probably a good thing for Bitcoin overall because it promotes you know, holding your own keys. And uh, we've seen so many losses from exchanges and things like that, that uh, I think people are becoming more and more aware of the need to hold it yourself. But. What about lawyers that don't know what they're talking about? I mean, just hearing you talk about this stuff, there seems to be so many different um, twists and turns. There's a lot of new people getting into this market. How long do you think somebody needs to be in crypto before they can even be a legal advisor? And and what have you seen? Have you seen a lot of people flooding in or are people still shying away from it? You know, I feel like I'm in my own little bubble a little bit. I haven't gone to a conference in a little while, but last you know the last couple of years when it was going to a lot more conferences there were a lot of lawyers there it's like it kind of attracted the sharks because there was uh you know a high payout if you could advise on an ico or if you'd write these legal opinion letters that coins weren't securities uh things like that so i'm not sure if it's still um such a buzz for new lawyers coming in the space or advisors um 
but I know there were a lot in the last couple of years. And I think it does, I mean, you can learn anything, you know, if you put your mind to it in a couple months and really pour over it. But I feel like Bitcoin, there's been so much over the years that come out, like, look, just in this last week, you know, we had all this. So if you're not really paying attention to it, it's, it's probably a lot to get your mind wrapped around if you haven't been kind of watching it unfold over the over time. So what are you going to take some time to focus on? I mean, you've been doing your podcast and you're still doing different kind of legal opinions, but what are you looking forward to over the next few months and next year in crypto? Um, well, <laughs> as much as I don't really like the FinCEN side of things, that's kind of where I've I've been, it's been my bread and butter to keep the law firm, you know, the lights on. So I'm actually going to take a, uh, it's called an ACAM certification. So it's a like money laundering compliance certification. And that lets the banks feel more confident when you're performing the independent reviews for the Bitcoin companies that, that you're doing, you know, you're testing the right things for their anti-money laundering program. So that's kind of my main focus lately is, uh, is just on the anti-money laundering side of things, or at least, you know, helping the companies get, get over the hurdle to try and get the bank account to get everything in order. But, but it does mean, you know, doing KYC on absolutely everything, um, which kind of is not always a favorite among the, uh, the businesses starting up. I'm going actually on, on uh, October 24th, which is my birthday. There's a event here in DC at the, the CFTC is putting on. It's like, let's talk FinTech or something like that. And it's free. So I'm looking forward to going to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you keep any uh, track on it? I know it's, it's busy enough keeping track of all the uh, regulations in, in the states, including all the different states have they bring, uh, having uh, lots of different regulations, um, not only the federal level, but uh, what about globally? Do you keep an eye on what the UK is doing? Is there a lot of play between you know, that and, uh, I don't know, Europe and, uh, and Asia? Yeah, I was trying to keep track of it the last couple of years, but I think I've kind of lost, uh, lost that one lately. Like it's, uh, there's been new things coming out from every, you know, all the European areas. It seems like everyone's putting a new crypto regulation framework together um, in the last little while. So I haven't stayed up on it that well, but I know in England, Mark Carney is, uh, you know, is in there and he used to be, I forget his exact title in Canada, but it's something with our, um, our, our Canadian Federal Reserve. And he was really well respected by, um, you know, by a lot of people in Canada. And I think he did a good job. And then we lost him to um, his current role in England. And uh, I've been watching a little bit of what he puts out on the crypto side. And he uh, I liked a few of the things that he put out over the last couple of years of uh, just, you know, analyzing it and whatnot. And I think in Europe, for the most part, on the security side, they have a rule that unless the asset is paying dividends, it's not going to be considered a security, which, you know, exempts most cryptocurrency projects from that. So I really like the way that they do that. But I think on the money laundering and KYC side, Europe has been a lot less uh, focused on on Bitcoin or collecting KYC. A lot of the different European zones don't have any policies on it, and uh, they're all st after those FATF regulations or you know recommendations. They weren't regulations, but uh, after those recommendations came out, it seemed like everyone's now working on putting some kind of licensing requirement on um, peer to peer transfers of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. So yeah, and, and I really wonder how this all play out with the rollout now second tier technologies, of course, Lightning Network is one of them, uh, the major one, and we are seeing uh, the anonymity s jump quite a quite a drastic step um with with technologies like this and this isn't uh and this isn't sort of built in on on purpose so to say it's just part of how the technology works it makes it very hard to trace um which which real money by the way is kind of how it's meant to be i mean uh, correct me if i'm wrong sasha but i think the original 
I, I read it years and years ago and I cannot find the original article, but it was something where the state, uh, the, U, the UK or some, some banker or something like that took the UK to court because he'd earned a lot of money from some deal. And then it found out that a lot of that money had been used in a robbery to transactions earlier and then that was forfeited, but there was no way of knowing. And so there was this big sort of fungibility uh, law. So, and that's kind of where fungibility laws come from. I don't know if, uh, if quite the details. It's something like that. And and so it is quite extraordinary to think, especially with something like that's a push technology like Bitcoin, where you really, you're not pulling the money from somewhere. Uh, you just, it just gets sent to your wallet. So you, and not only that, it's, it's made up of lots of different transactions so the, 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 the Bitcoin that you get might be made up of 30 different transactions that might be made up of a uh, hundred different transactions before that. So you might have, you know, 10 Satoshis that have been in a robbery three transactions ago. And, you know, it, it's just, it's so complex. There's no way of really dealing with that stuff as a normal person, because if you get paid for your coffee, uh, let's say, and uh, you know, there are a couple of Satoshis that were in a, in a robbery, two transactions, three transactions ago. What are you meant to do? Are you meant to uh, like send it back? You can't because you don't actually know where this came from uh, in some circumstances. You just, you know, it just arrives and this, it, it triggers something that then gets, you know. So it's, it's, uh, it's a very complex issue. And uh, and we'll see how it plays out with these these second layer solutions because uh, yeah well it's uh, you know the the regulations are already now catching up to base layer Bitcoin and and it makes it dangerous for so depending on which um, you know where you're getting your Bitcoin from if you're doing it like say you go to Coinbase and then use it at Starbucks and one of them doesn't catch that the Bitcoin has just been used in a, you know, a dark web transaction or something like that, but the next person does and they say block your transaction and then you can't spend that Bitcoin and uh, it's, um, or, or you sell it to someone else and then their whatever place they try and use it, they have a even higher level of KYC and they block uh, your using it. So it, it really, I think is dangerous for the fungibility of it, but all that you're supposed to do as a company, if you find stuff like that out and the amount is more than $2,000, um, your, your, the transaction, then you're supposed to submit a suspicious activity report on it, but there shouldn't be anything where it, it, it blacklists the coins, like based on the guidance from FinCEN is not, they're not, they're not the ones saying to do that. And then it's the, the people's own KYC policies are taking it upon themselves to then blacklisted because they saw it was on a dark web or something like that. So it's a, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to watching, watching it unfold now, but. Yeah. And there's also very interesting crossovers, especially here in Europe where you have the, uh, a lot of privacy uh, laws for coming from the European parliament to say that companies aren't allowed to share information, even with law enforcement. Uh, you, you have to have, uh, a, you know, you can't, a law enforcement can't, can't just, demand something they have to really go to court the court needs to uh, issue something for a single person it you know it could never really happen what the irs did to coinbase and just sort of dragnet everybody uh, i'm sure that's different for different countries but um, the gdpr stuff definitely is uh, makes it very difficult for us to to uh, do anything really without you know sort of crossing some boundary that wasn't thought of when they were created these laws because crypto is sort of this new thing yeah well i mean if you think about it if they want to come look inside your house they need to prove that they have a reason to look and you know go get a warrant and then they can search um but they have to have you know reasonable cause to prove that there's something going on but with the way that the financial side of it's working under the Bank Secrecy Act and then now getting applied globally with the um, with the FATF recommendations. It's like they don't need really any reasonable cause. It's just the overarching fear of terrorism that allows them to look at every single transaction without any, um, you know, any, well, I mean, their reasonable cause is that there's, you know, the threat that there could be terrorism if they aren't looking at it, I guess. But uh, it's, it's, it's gotten pretty, pretty far from what it was before the internet age. Um, 
And then the UK now, I saw something, they're trying to ban uh, encrypted chats too, so. Yeah, the UK is a big fan of doing that. Yeah. And if you go there, there's, there's just cameras everywhere. It's like, it's more than, I think they were beating China in the camera wars, like how many cameras per capita. Um, but I'm not sure if that's changed now because China's really stepping it up. <laughs> well, that. yeah, those Hong Kong protest gear is kind of fun watching, you know, how smart that the kids are getting there to, to make themselves undetectable. Yeah, I saw a hat projector where you sort of wear this hat and it projects another face onto your face. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I saw that cool. too. You I mean, that? it's cool that they're doing that, but what happens if, you know, the government is pushing and pushing and pushing and some of the things that they're pushing for are not even realistic. So how does that play out in the end, right? Well, I, I think mean, it plays out a do lot. Do they just take people that are political dissidents and since everybody's breaking the same law, they make them the the sacrificial lambs or do they just say you know what this isn't working this is silly forget it we're just gonna leave everybody alone i mean i don't know I, yeah it's a very I, good question it's not very like it's not very good progress in certain ways you know yeah and it's like one of those things where you know when you go from taking the bus to owning your own car it's very unlikely you're ever going to go back to taking the bus like is the government going to be like oh we have all this free data we can look at everything we want we can read everyone's texts emails you know look at them in their living room we know what area of the house they're in when they're on their computers let's scale that back i think we've overstepped here like no i don't think it ever goes backwards from where we are today but. that's a great point that's what makes uh, the Snowden book, for example, so interesting. You know, I thought the movie was okay, but I thought the book was quite good. And I think it really, it's important to keep re-raising the idea that um, privacy is so important and it's something that people take for granted. And we're sort of in this big battle right now. I don't know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I don't think that they can make, for example, encryption illegal in, in the UK. I mean, how would they do that? I don't know. Because won't other technologies sort of have, you know, um, like satellite stuff up in space and then mesh networks and stuff like that? I mean, can't they just get around these kind of limitations? I think generally it's about, uh, it's kind of like what old school taxation law was. There was no way to track all your spending. There was no way to tr trace all your money. All they basically said is, it, you better be telling the truth. Because if we bust you not telling the truth, then you go to prison. And so I think the same thing is like, you better not be using encryption because if we bust you, then you will go to prison, even though there's no way for us to really tell easily. And we really have to be looking. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's extremely difficult to, to I mean, uh, it's just a weird law. It's just a weird, weird law, especially the fact that if you look at the latest, uh, most recent, sort of terrorist attacks over the last years, they've all been using open SMS without any encryption to be organizing themselves. And they still haven't busted those guys. Uh, they had, they, you know, they got away with the, the, the terrorist act actually followed through. Um, so it's ridiculous to blame encryption. Even the, so the telegram action that the SEC, you know, they, they put that emergency cease and desist they cited Telegram as being like the cryptocurrency, you know, messenger of ch messaging service of choice. And it, it actually read like an ad for Telegram to me when I was reading it. They're talking about what geniuses the guys, the, the brothers that started it were. And they had started a, uh, a you know, kind of similar to Facebook um, network that was popular in Russia and Europe. And that got shut down. And then when it, they moved and now they're citizens of um Nevis or the Cayman Islands, I believe, and uh, just talking about yeah, how but they're not as sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go you go ahead. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, Telegram isn't as secure as Signal. I don't know. I don't hear any of my security friends talking about Telegram. Everybody likes Signal much better. Mm -hmm. And now it's Wire. It's the next big. It's the next new kid on the block. What is it? Oh, uh, it's it's like a. F fully encrypted end to end and all the all the cool kids are using wire yeah. is it put out by the u.s government no no it's uh, fully open source and the rest of it oh, check it out yeah check it out it's pretty good mm -hmm. cool
Cool. Rock and roll. Well, anything else that we should cover, guys? What do you think? I think we went over a lot of good stuff today. Yeah, I mean, it would be good to maybe have you back on the show as this uh, it comes out and everything plays out, especially with the Telegram stuff. It's very interesting. We didn't get to cover too much of that, but I would like to, you know, we have gone over time a little bit and it would be good to get you back to talk about that once we find out what happens. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like in the back. Around, well, I, I shouldn't say this out loud, probably, but I'm hoping they just do it and like kind of go say, well, you, I'm not a U.S. citizen and, you know, come and get me if you dare um, and do their ICO anyway. But I don't think that's what they're going to do. I think, the, you know, they put out a statement, I think, either in the last couple of days saying that they're, they're considering halting the, uh, their ICO. So we'll see what happens with that. It will be interesting to watch it unfold. I mean, why are they still ICOing anyway? Didn't they raise like a billion dollars privately? What the? Yeah, they already raised a ton of money and they raised it from US investors and they actually followed the appropriate channels. Like they did Regulation D and uh, I think they got, was it $1.7 billion? Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly what their ICO, what they need anymore for either, but uh but yeah, they could maybe airdrop these Ton tokens, or I don't know what the tokens are going to be used for either. Do you? I, I haven't had time to be uh, to be yeah. following through. You know, we're relaunching Voltoro 2.0, and there's a lot of stuff going on around in my head. So, it's, uh, yeah, watching Telegram have, unfold it hasn't been top of my priority. But um, I think you know, when when they raised 1.7 billion, my God, they. Uh, they did it all through private investment. And the, the, the thing that the really glorious part of an ICO and the concept of it, the great part of it is that you uh, spread out to thousands of people who then become your marketing channels because they're mm -hmm. invested in a way in you. So the, the, the concept sort of falls down if you just do your sort of ICO in brackets just privately and you have like maybe, I don't know, 30 people that are, <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, instead of hundreds and uh, you know maybe that they're going after that sort of marketing channel uh, even that doesn't really make sense because they've already got such a large network I don't know why they would need more investors for the marketing slant of an ICO so I, I don't understand why they need more money to be honest mm -hmm. but I, I do love telegram like I think it's you know I love the features of it it's it's really easy to use and um Really? I dislike it immensely. Oh. I, I don't know. I can't get it to work the way that I want it to. I don't know. I'm a signal girl. Uh, I've had to use a third party app because I really wanted my groups in a separate tab because the groups just kept on pushing every other conversation I'd have with person to person down and then I wouldn't you see can, it. And... You can pin your conversations you want it. So if you want to keep a few at the top, um, you can pin them. Yeah. But yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> I like this. Okay. Story. But, so uh, Sasha, where can people listen to your podcast and where can people catch up with you? Oh yeah, it's uh I have a website, sashahodler.com, and I put my podcast and various blogs uh, out on there. So that's probably the best spot or to Twitter at Sasha Hodler. Um, yeah. Awesome. Is that Hodler or Hodder? Well, my last name is Hodder, but I spell it Hodler for my online stuff. Nice, nice. That was good. Except then I changed. I then I've changed it to Shaw to Sash Shaw two fifty six. But I didn't want to use all the other stuff. But I like that actually better than. I feel like Hodler is a little played out. But your name is just built for crypto, isn't it? <laughs> Sasha two fifty six Hodler. I mean, you can't get any better than that. <laughs> awesome. All right, Josh. Where can people catch up with you? I know you guys are on Bank to the Future right now. Anything you want to tell the audience? Yeah, BNK to the future. Check it out uh, if you're outside of the US, of course. And um, and yeah, at J Shigala, that's S-C-I-G-A-L-A -A, um, on Twitter. Awesome. So the Tatiana Show comes out on Tuesdays and sometimes Thursdays and other random days. Go to thetatianashow.com and listen, share, review it positively. And uh, also, if you're interested in a show about emotional intelligence and relationships, go to Proof of Love Cast. Dot com, And those shows go out on Fridays. I'm going to be in Birmingham November 3rd with um, Mad Bitcoin. So we're going to be hanging out. And uh, Thomas and I will be uh, terrorizing the countryside November 3rd in Birmingham. Go to Bitbrum. That's the name of the conference. B-I-T-B-R-U-M. Check it out. 
November 3rd. And then also I might be at La Bitcon. Even if I'm not there, you guys should all check it out, if, especially if you're in Latin America. Um, it's in Uruguay this year, December 14th and 15th. So check it out, La Bitcon. Uh, thank you everybody for listening to the show. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>